Hi, this is Steve with Thresher Media Group. Welcome to When You're Ready to Listen. This podcast is dedicated to exploring the truth about God, things you may not have understood, may not have been taught, or quite frankly, had a very hard time believing. And since our entire relationship with God rests on believing, it is important we learn how to separate the truth from the many lies and fictions that abound within the religion of Christianity. So when you're ready to listen, tune in and discover a pathway to freedom, encouragement, life, and hope. Jesus has a name. Episode 18. Call upon his name. Yahweh Mekodeshkin Part 2. We closed our last episode on somewhat of a cliffhanger as we begin to address this issue of the called of God and the chosen of God. For many are called and few chosen. The called and the chosen. To quickly review, Yahweh Mekodeshkem has selected people out from amongst the great sea of humanity to be his own, to be holy, much like he did with the nation of Israel. Why? Because that's what he does. No one earns it. No one deserves it. Rather, like a dragnet that pulls in all manner of fish, Yahweh Mekodeshkem pulls in all manner of people into his household from all the nations, peoples, tongues, and tribes of this world, declaring that they are holy, set apart unto him. The name Yahweh Mekodeshkem encapsulates the fundamental principle of grace. It is all about what he has done, 100%, and nothing, 0%, about what we have done or can do for him. He does the work of making us holy. We simply must be willing to let him. Remember, he will not violate our personal sovereignty. We must choose to allow him access to our lives. Accordingly, this name is intimately tied to the glorious truth that only God is good. For our calling into the household of God was not about anything we did right or wrong or anything that we would do right or wrong in the future. It was always about the separation made in the desire and the wisdom of Yahweh Mekodeshkem. Those who are holy are holy simply because he said so. By the way, this word holy is not addressing our behaviors or deeds that are deemed to be fitting of a Christian. Rather, it speaks of a relationship, position, determination, or a declaration. To be holy means that a person or thing has been set apart by God for God's purposes, regardless of whether that person or thing even realizes what that means. Hence, anyone who has been called into the household of God is by definition holy by means of their inclusion in his household. He makes them holy. But as with Israel, who was made holy and set apart from all the other nations in the world, this position, this calling, does nothing in and of itself to change a person's heart or their obsession with their flesh, with their old sinful nature. In the same manner, it does nothing in and of itself to alter a person's behavior, to be less sinful and more holy, as we commonly understand that phrase. But being called into his household, being set apart as holy, is not the end game. It is the start or the beginning of the journey. His end game is that we become like him, that we are transformed into the image of the Son so we can be called sons of God. In fact, being brought into his household is what gives us the opportunity or the right to become, not to be, but to become children of God. John chapter 1, verse 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, or literally the power, to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. With the word become being rendered in the aorist tense and the middle voice, we know that a person must dig down deep in their soul and choose, as a matter of lifestyle, to become a child of God. And he gave him the right or the power to do it, with the right being rendered in the indicative. So we know it's a statement of fact. And with believe being rendered in the present active participle, this right or power is given to those who now and continually believe in his name, to those who are now believing that he is Yahweh, there I am. 
This indicates that just being in the household of God does not guarantee sonship with God. Said another way, there is a second step that must occur after we have been born again, after we've been converted or brought into the household of God. A person must choose to dig down deep in their soul and become a little child who is dependent upon Yahweh for everything all the time. A person must, in effect, choose to enter the Sabbath rest, leaving everything else in their lives up to the will of Yahweh. Hence, as with Israel and the separation he made between the priests and the Levites and the people at large, or the separation he made between Israel and Judah, Yahweh Mekodeshkin makes a further separation between those who have been called into his household and choose to exercise that right to become sons and those who do not. For many are called and few chosen. For instance, one way to look at it is that there were somewhere between two and a half to six million Jews who left Egypt to travel all the way to the promised land. But of those numbers, only two, Joshua and Caleb, were permitted by God to enter. This amounts to approximately 0.00008% to 0.00003% of those who were actually called out of Egypt. Then take this number and compare it to the population of the world at that time, and you get a mind-blowing, extremely small percentage. Only Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land. The rest of that generation languished in unbelief and were killed in the wilderness as Yahweh swore in his wrath that they would not enter his rest. Although 30% of the modern world claims to be Christian, these percentages is likely why Jesus wondered whether he will ever find faith on the earth when he returns. The Sabbath Rest In the book of Hebrews, there's a huge warning to those who identify as believers those who have been called into the household by Yahweh Mekodeshkim. It speaks of dire consequences for those who fail to enter this Sabbath rest, who fail to live according to grace, where a person's holiness is not earned, not deserved, but granted by God, the only one who is good, where any work that is done is what he does in and through our lives and not what we do for him. Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter into it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day. Today, saying through David, after so long a time, Just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered in his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of unbelief. Now, this is a sobering warning. We are to live in rest and not come short of it following the example of unbelief set for us by the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness and died, never entering the promised land. A Sabbath life of rest speaks of a life without burdens, without weight, without striving, without work. This speaks of those who learn only to do what the Father tells them to do when he tells them to do it, and no more. It's how Jesus lived and related to his Father, and it is how those who live in rest relate to the Father. For it is only those who do the will of the Father who will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
This excludes all those who do for the Father as they will in a good-hearted attempt to be good, to do good, and to please and honor Him. As we have learned, such things are meaningless to God. The source matters. The source is everything. This distinction will become extremely important as we understand this difference between the called and the chosen. We will find that those who live in the Sabbath life learn to live in unrestrained freedom. They are those who dig down deep in their soul and are now believing in his name, believing that he is their I am, their sufficiency for all things. They believe that he has done the work and he will always do the work so they can rest doing only what he specifically asked them to do when he asked. These are those who believe in the design point, and they are convinced that unless Jesus Christ is the one who lives in them, doing the work of the Father in them, they are just doing deeds of the flesh, no matter how religious those deeds might be. Using another metaphor to explain a metaphor, as is typical of the Holy Spirit, we can consider the household of Abraham to comprehend the separation between the called and the chosen. In Abraham's household, he had two biological sons from different mothers. The eldest, Ishmael, was the son of Sarah's servant, Hagar, whereas the youngest, Isaac, was the son of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Ishmael was a result of Abraham and Sarah's attempt to do for God what he had promised, to give Abraham a son, an heir. The apparent problem was that Yahweh did not specify that their heir would be from his wife, Sarah who had been practically barren all her life for 90 years. He just told Abraham, one will come from your own body. He shall be your heir. And it was this obvious confusion, given Sarah's barrenness, that led from one thing to the next. And before you know it, Hagar was in Abraham's tent, and Ishmael was soon on the scene as their eldest son. Apparently, after many attempts and the passing of time, With Sarah still not pregnant, she planted a seed of thought into Abraham that maybe God did not mean that Abraham's heir would come directly from Sarah, from her own womb, but indirectly from Sarah through her maid, Hagar, who would function as a surrogate. Heck, Abraham was convinced, probably didn't take much convincing, and needless to say, Hagar had a son. Sarah and Hagar both function as allegories, one being a free woman, and one being a bondwoman or a slave. We are told in Galatians that these two women are symbolic of two covenants, which are pictured by two mountains. You know, the metaphor explaining a metaphor. I know, pictures to explain pictures. It's the way of the spirit. But hang in there with me. There are two women, two covenants, two mountains. By the way, number two is the biblical number of division as in the separation between the called and the chosen. There are three sets of two, which makes for a perfect explanation of division. Three is the biblical number of perfection. And there are a total of six descriptors, which is the biblical number of man. Therefore, this description of two women, two covenants, and two mountains provide us the perfect picture or explanation of how Yahweh divides those who live in his household, those who have been brought in via the dragnet. Hagar represents Mount Sinai, the covenant of the law, whose standard is perfection, bearing children who are destined to be slaves, whereas Sarah represents Mount Zion, Jerusalem above, and the covenant of promise, bearing children who are free, for they are sons according to the promise. They are not slaves or children of the law. Hagar equals Mount Sinai equals the law. Sarah equals Mount Zion equals promise of sonship. The point is that both children dwelled together in Abraham's tents and called Abraham their Abba, their father. However, one child was an offspring of the law of slavery and would not inherit with the son who is the offspring of freedom, the child of promise. Now let us move this allegory forward and apply it to our lives. Many are called by Yahweh Mekodeshkim into his household and set apart as holy unto him. 
Some, however, choose to live as slaves bound by the law, whether that is the law, their law, or the law of others. And they are constantly trying to be good and do good and do their best to be good, obedient Christians. Whereas others choose to embrace their sonship and live free. Now, while in the household, both call Yahweh Father and Jesus their Savior, but they are divided. Those who love their sonship inherit along with a son, but those who love their indentured servitude are like the bad fish that get tossed out at the end of the age. Matthew 13, 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of God is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. The implication of it all is that God will cast out those slaves in his household who live by the law. This takes us back to some of that language in Exodus and Leviticus in terms of the consequences of choosing to reject the Sabbath life, being cut off from the community and death. Whether we fully realize it or not in our practical day in and day out lives, sons born of the free woman Sarah live under the freedom of God's grace where all things are lawful. Can you imagine all things are lawful? That is a mind bender. Sons of the bondwoman Hagar, however, continue to live according to the worthless elemental principles of this world comprised of what to do and what not to do and all the myriads of ways to try and find the favor of God, the blessing of God, and the presence of God. Short summary. Let's take a quick breather and summarize where we are before we move on to the consequences of rejecting our freedom, rejecting our Sabbath life, by choosing to live under the bondage of the law as a slave. To call upon Yahweh Makodeshkem in faith means that, number one, we understand that Yahweh Makodeshkem has set us apart exclusively for himself. Hence, by definition, we are holy simply because of this wonderful relational position in which he has placed us. He has called us to be holy. Number two, in response to our calling and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we choose to live in the unrestrained freedom he has purchased for us, refusing to live another day like a slave bound to the elemental principles of this world, bound to the law, my law, your law, or to anybody's law. To live this way is to celebrate a Sabbath life of rest. It's the only way to be found in Christ or established in grace. It is how one who is called becomes one who is chosen. Please do not miss what I just said. Saying the sinner's prayer and going to church and serving and witnessing and giving and even doing ministry does not cause one to be found in Christ, nor does it establish one in grace. Those wonderful epitaphs and all the promises associated with them, like there being no condemnation, for those who are in Christ Jesus? Those are reserved for those who are sons, for those who rest, for those who have embraced the Sabbath life. Rejecting the Sabbath life. According to Exodus 31 and Leviticus 20, if a person rejected the Sabbath life, they would number one, get cut off from the people of God, and number two, be subject to the death penalty. These same two consequences are applicable to our lives as believers. And this truth is all wrapped up in the name Yahweh Sidkenu, Yahweh our righteousness. Now, let us stop here and we'll pick up on our next episode as we explore the dynamic and the consequences of rejecting the Sabbath life. To get a free download of the full written transcript with all the scripture references footnoted, please go to threshermediagroup.com. That is T-H-R-E-S-H-E-R mediagroup.com This is Steve. 
with Thresher Media Group. When you're ready to listen, tune in.